Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the afternoon's second session of workshop. You are in the workshop um, ensuring schools are prioritizing health using Kaiser Permanente's planning for the next normal at school playbook. Um, I'm joined today by a wonderful presenter. We'll get into that presentation quickly. Um, first, I have a couple quick housekeeping notes. Um, conference sessions are recorded and will be made available on the Hublot platform to the end of October. And um, we will be posting recordings on our California School-Based Health Alliance website after that. Slides will also be shared after the conference. Um, we will be taking question and answers and, and responding to chats after the end of the presentation. So we'll, we'll end a little bit before 1.30 and at that point you'll be able to, we'll, we'll get to your questions. So please feel free to um, post comments in the chat section and any questions you have in the Q&A section. And then finally, as another reminder that we are collecting evaluations at the end of each day. Um, so please make sure to look for a link to that evaluation in your email. Um, and we will also be posting a link to those evaluations in the conference feed. Um, and if you complete the evaluation after each day, you'll be entered into a raffle um, to win great prizes. So definitely make sure you are looking for that and completing with that. And with that, I am going to turn it over to our presentation and we will um, start our workshop. Hold on just a second. Hi everyone and welcome. We're really pleased to be here at the California School-Based Health Alliance's 2020 virtual conference. Um, I'm Mariah LaFleur, National Program Lead for Thriving Schools at Kaiser Permanente. And I really look forward to spending the next window of time with you sharing our resources that ensure schools are prioritizing health by using a Kaiser Permanente planning for the next normal at schools playbook. I want to start with a human moment and an appreciation for all of you. These are hard times and whatever your role is in supporting students, families or staff, what you're doing is crucial. I personally have a first grader and a high schooler and they're fully virtually learning from home right here around the corner. You may hear them uh, at various points during this presentation. This has all helped me be even more appreciative than normal for teachers, educators, the school system and everybody who supports our educators and our families. Um, I just wanna say a big thank you for all that you're doing to support my family, all the families and schools that, that you work with and for showing up here today to spend this time with me. Today in our time together, I want to go over a few objectives. Uh, first off, we want to orient you to the Kaiser Permanente's led planning for the next normal at schools playbook. We think this is a really useful tool that we wanna to make sure you and your schools and districts are aware of. We're gonna especially take a deep dive into two of the most key chapters, mental health and well-being for students, and we'll share some of our RISE initiative materials. And secondly, we'll take a deep dive into staff and teacher well-being. And then finally, at the end, we'll discuss how you can take specific action on the playbook and on RISE. So I wanna give a brief intro into those of you who aren't familiar with Kaiser Permanente and why we work in school health. Kaiser Permanente is the nation's largest integrated healthcare system. We provide care and coverage for over 12 million members in these eight regions, as you can see here on the slide. However, we put out free high quality school health resources for every school in the nation, not just within our regions. The fact that we're a healthcare provider means that we are currently, of course, on the front lines of responding to COVID. This includes providing testing and treatment to all of our members and patients who need that. It also means though that we understand that a lot of what happens outside of the four walls of our medical office building is really critical to health and to the health outcomes of our members and our broader communities. And that's specifically why we launched Thriving Schools about eight years ago. Um, so we've been around for a while and we've sharpened and improved our focus in the last few years. Uh, Thriving Schools is Kaiser Permanente's initiative to support the physical, mental health and total health needs of all the educators and students. We've always understood that health and education are inextricably linked and we know that now more than ever during this pandemic and all of the social injustice and racial injustice that's been going on. School-based health interventions, whether in person or virtual, are really critical for students, teachers, staff, and families. And we really want them to be able to show up the best 
to teach and learn in whatever type of setting school is happening right now. 20% or one in five of our Kaiser members spends their day in schools. And now more than ever, we know that we need to show up to support schools in our education system. So how Thrive in Schools does this? Uh, we specifically serve teachers and staff as well as students. It's a big focus for us because we understand that educators need to show up their best to allow students to achieve the educational and health outcomes we want. We focus on all aspects of health. Originally, we had a big focus on healthy eating, active living, the physical aspects of health. In the last few years, we've gotten pretty deep into the social, emotional, and mental health space. And now, and going forward, we're moving even more into the social drivers of health and racial equity. I'll share some of that in the playbook. The way that we do this is through changing the policies and practices that schools and districts have, and also changing the systems that run schools and districts. So um, the space that kids and teachers spend their day in. We do this on a few levels. Um, in our specific Kaiser regions, we have intensive support for a limited number of schools in our footprint. Um, and then we have broad reach resources for schools and districts in our footprint and across the country. So those are free, available to all resources, such as this playbook we're gonna go into today, as well as the RISE resources. And then finally, we do participate in movement building efforts to support coalitions, larger groups, other organizations that are really contributing to the national school health conversation. So moving a bit to where schools and the education system are, or especially where they were when things pivoted and the pandemic happened in spring. Um, once schools closed down fully in March, we realized that we needed to talk to our schools and districts in our regions and nationally to figure out what they needed so we could best support their needs. Um, we wanted to get a sense of, of, you know, what would be most useful in the challenging time they were in that spring and then also going forward in the summer and then now this fall space that we're in, uh, you know, what we could do to support them in, in, in the most, the most useful way. So we did a survey. It included nearly 900 respondents. Um, it had responses from 46 states in the, in the country, so nearly every state participated. 80% um, of the people were school employees. The other percent were, were mostly at the district level, and there were some other school stakeholders that don't work specifically at schools that responded. Um, about 36% were support staff, um, administrators, and the remaining 70-some percent were specifically teachers. Um, just over half were elementary level, and then the other about 20, 25 to 30% were at the secondary level, middle and high school teachers, and the remaining were people at the district level. And then finally, we wanted to get a bit of a regional snapshot on the survey, um, knowing that there's regional differences in the pandemic and, and how, how everybody is responding and, and living their lives. So about half of them were urban schools and districts, specifically in larger cities, and about 30 to 40% were in suburban areas and somewhere in rural as well. So this survey was really critical to us. Uh, we sent it around far and wide and just asked basically how people are doing and what their needs were. And we got a lot of rich data, uh, but the main takeaways were that um, people need safe environments and clear instruction and guidance, and they needed resources supporting in really unprecedented time. They wanted increased staff support, time to process and adjust with their peers and with some of their classes and students, and then they just really mentioned over and over the importance of mental health and well-being support in, in, in a really challenging time. So given these key findings, uh, we decided we could lean into some of them. Of course, we can't meet everybody's needs all the time, but um, the, the need for clear instructions and guidance and resources, and especially a focus on mental health and well-being, really felt like something we could work on. So um, we worked with over 30 national school health partners. You can see here the impressive list of, of partners uh, that represent unions, um, school health organizations, uh, mental health organizations that work in schools. We had a really amazing group of partners that we convened that, that uh, helped co-write and gave input into this playbook that I'm about to share with you. So working with all these amazing partners helped us achieve writing the Planning for the Next Normal at School playbook, uh, keeping students, staff, teachers, and families safe and healthy, which launched um, our first edition about two months ago. It covers five main chapters that you'll see here. We're going to take a deep dive into a couple of them. And this was really important for us to think about health as, as a whole aspect of what is happening at schools, not just virus prevention or just mental health prevention. We really wanted to think about all the ways that schools and districts need to be healthy right now. There's also some common elements that are woven through the whole playbook. Uh, focusing on school and district policies is really important. 
equity, diversity, and inclusion um, is woven in throughout, as, as you'll see once you dig into the playbook. And finally, family and community engagement, making sure that those that are outside the school building or school walls, um, families are more important now than ever. So we have we have uh, resources for them throughout, and we have a new family checklist I'll mention at the end of our time together. So I want to call out knowing that there are a lot of resources out there, and there have been other playbooks and, and um, pieces put out by other really great partners, some of them those that actually contributed to this, to this playbook. So I want to mention what makes this different than others. Uh, first off, as I mentioned a moment ago, this highlights all the different dimensions of health, thinking about the physical, social, emotional, mental, um, the you know racial equity. We really tried to cover health as, as, as a whole person and as a whole school, and we have chapters that reflect all of those. Um, this offers new and additive content. We didn't duplicate anything that any of our partners are doing, but rather we link and point to other quality resources because we know there's a lot of other good things that, that have been put out there. Um, it's really specific and actionable. Every single section, as you'll see, offers five plays for each dimension of health, and there's a checklist that goes with that, so you know exactly what to do to address those specific aspects of health. And as I mentioned before, we had over 30 organizations uh, help write and edit and facilitate this playbook, so we really have a broad swath of experts that weighed in on this, which we're really proud of. So in order to give you a better idea of what the playbook is, we want to take a deeper dive into two of the chapters. The first one is going to be the mental health and well-being chapter. And we have a treat where we get to look at some pre-recorded conversations with the experts that put these chapters together. So first, I'd like to welcome Flora Daniel, National Project Manager on our Kaiser Permanente Thriving Schools team, who I have to pause and say was the true mastermind behind so much of this playbook, and she really made it happen. So really happy to welcome Flora who's interviewing Elizabeth Cook, Senior National Advisor um, of Social Emotional Health at the Alliance for a Healthier Generation, who uh, co-wrote and scripted the entire mental health and well-being chapter. Um, so here's some, some time with the two of them. Welcome to a conversation on the mental health and well-being chapter of the Planning for Next Normal at School Playbook. I'm Flora Daniel, National Project Manager, Thriving Schools at Kaiser Permanente. During this conversation, we'll walk through the five plays, learn about activation or implementation strategies, and supporting resources. In this video, you will see some pages from the Kaiser Permanente-led playbook, planning for the next normal, keeping students, staff, teachers, and families safe and healthy. Today, I'm joined by Elizabeth Cook, Senior National Advisor, Social Emotional Health at Alliance for a Healthier Generation. Elizabeth is also the co-author of the Mental Health and Wellbeing chapter. Welcome, Elizabeth. Hey, Flora. Nice to see you today. Nice to see you as well. Well, to get our conversation started, can you tell us a bit about your background and expertise? Oh, yeah, sure. Happy to. So, um, like Flora said, I am the Senior National Advisor of Social Emotional Health here at the Alliance for a Healthier Generation. I am a school psychologist by training and have over a decade of field experience in urban, rural, and suburban settings. Um, I also uh, have state-level experience. I used to work at the Wisconsin Department of Public Instruction as both the school mental health and school psychology consultants, where my primary role there was really around supporting schools and districts in implementing comprehensive school mental health with the specific Specific focused on trauma sensitive schools. Um, I'm also a member of my local school board and I'm a parent of a school aged child. So I feel like I come to this from multiple different lenses, multiple different prongs of my life that sort of all converged together. That's awesome, Elizabeth. You have a, a, a well rounded expertise in this and in, in the subject matter today. Um, but leaning more towards your expertise in mental health and well being, can you tell us a, a bit why it's um, so critical to address mental health and well-being as we plan for the next school year. Yeah, so, you know, we've always known that learning is emotional, right, and that addressing mental health and wellness for our students and staff is critical for achieving academic success. The disruptions that were caused by COVID-19 have only heightened mental health and wellness concerns that we have of our students and also of our adults as well. If we want our students to feel reconnected, re-engaged, re-energized about school this fall, then we need to ensure that they're mentally healthy first and foremost. Before we dive deeper into the plays, I'd like to walk us through um, all the five chapter or plays for this chapter. So first, we have a community building activities. Next is trauma-informed training, open discussions on environmental stressors, 
social emotional skill building and mental health support services. So Elizabeth, if you could tell us a bit about how, how does community building support resilience and mental health and what are some ways schools can do this? Yeah, so there's a reason why this play is the very first one because it sets the foundation for a lot of the work that we'll be doing in rebuilding our schools as we open in the fall. The more connected a person feels to their school community, the more likely they are to attend school and engage in learning. So community building isn't just a nice thing to do. It's essential, right? It's necessary as it directly enhances academic success. And there are some really great strategies out there to help support you in doing this. But before you dig into those strategies, the first step that I always encourage educators to do is to not think about their classroom spaces first, but actually think about the community spaces that they exist in, uh, that they really enjoy, right? The ones that make them feel safe and seen and supported, whether it's a book club or a gym or just a really good group of friends. Um, really think about what makes that space so welcoming and so great for you. And when I ask that question of educators, usually a few themes pop up. Uh, people talk about those spaces uh, being strength space. So people are recognizing me for what I bring to the table versus, you know, what might be some of my growth areas or opportunities for me to grow uh, a little bit more or, or sort of be better. Uh, the other thing that they do is they often promote authenticity. So those are places where I can show up and be my authentic self uh, in all of my fullness uh, without worrying about being you know, judged for that or people not liking me. And finally, they usually have a set of shared values or norms. So this feeling, the feeling that you get when you're in your own community spaces, is the feeling we want to replicate for our school community. A couple of quick strategies for doing this. Developing group agreements so we all have that shared norm with our students is really, really, really critical. Um, we also can engage in morning meetings so that we can really know our students uh, as whole people, right? So know their names, know their stories, know their learning styles and how they approach the day can be really important. Uh, and finally, engaging in authentic gratitude practices is a really great evidence-based strategy to build those connection points. So I do want to highlight one of the links on this page. Uh, throughout this chapter, you will see several links that say see more. You can see it highlighted in yellow over there. Um, each one of these links takes you to a section of an assessment that we at Healthier Generation co-built with Kaiser Permanente called the RISE Index. This is a no-cost assessment that gauges how well schools and districts are doing on addressing key uh, levers and best practices in the area of uh, social emotional health. So this is the cover of the RISE Index School Edition. We also have an edition for uh, districts as well. And this is a tool where not only you can assess what you want to do, but you can set and plan goals and really use that for action planning and to gauge resources. What you'll see here is an example from our school systems section, which asks exactly what we've been talking about today, right? So how uh, well and how often do you engage uh, your students in relationship building opportunities? Great. Thank you, Elizabeth. Um for highlighting the, the RISE, RISE Index and, and other resources that um, our audience can check out. Um, so many schools are aware of the importance of trauma-informed training. Um, what are some best practices that schools can consider? Yeah, so for me, when I, I, when I think of trauma-informed training and, and schools, one of the biggest missteps that schools make in their trauma-informed journey is to engage in trauma-informed training, which is really great and become sort of trauma-aware, but then that's where they stop. So trauma-informed training is a critical first step, right? We want folks to have a foundational knowledge and a common language with which they're working from. But becoming a trauma-informed school is a transformative process. It starts with training, so becoming aware, and then you start to embed the principles and practices into your system. And that's patchy and awkward, right? So that sort of feeling of, of just uncomfortableness is part of the process. That's what we call trauma responsive. And because we know repetition builds fluency, eventually the more that we do that, right, as we infuse things into our system, um, trauma-informed practices become how we do business as a school. So that's the transformation. So to apply the trauma-informed training, one of the recommendations that um, I always like to make is to take a look at one or two key policies through the trauma-informed lens. A good place to start in general, but particularly for this time, are discipline and attendance. Now is a really good time to look and revise those policies since reopening is going to require us to look at things like 
PPE enforcement, right? Whether or not kids are, you know, masked if they're supposed to be or staying distance apart. And what do we do when students are in violation of that? Um, and also flexible attendance as we think about balancing in-person, hybrid, and virtual learning experiences. So you want your leadership team to stay really focused and practice on applying that lens in a small way first. And once you get comfortable, you start to expand to the other policies. So that's the policy side of things. On the practice side, the fundamental first strategy of trauma-informed care is shifting our mindset as educators. When we see behavior in our classroom that is not in keeping with our expectations, rather than assuming that behavior is willful or intentional, we want to train our brains uh, to, by default, ask the question, hey, what's getting in the way of this student learning? That's it. That's the strategy. Doing this, right, asking what's getting in the way, puts us in a state of problem solving, reduces our own defensiveness, keeps us regulated, and paves the way for useful intervention. So I want to take a second here and highlight a great no-cost resource. The Wisconsin Department of Public Instruction, where I, I used to work, has uh, over 25 modules to support schools uh, in becoming a trauma-sensitive school. They're all free, available um, at no cost to any school that wants to use them. What I like about these modules is that they're set within the context of a multi-tiered system support. So whether you're thinking about universal practices or more targeted intervention supports through a trauma-informed lens, it's all there for you. And it's more more than just training, right? The knowledge is there. And then also, in addition to that, there are some supplemental readings that you can do to deepen your knowledge. And every module has an implementation tool. So I can take the concept that's in the module and directly apply it to my school community so that I can actually work on that transformative process that we talked about earlier. Well, thank you, Elizabeth. Sounds like the, the tools will be very applicable to all schools and will kind of meet them where they, where they are in, in the implementation phase. Exactly. Great. Well, we know that COVID-19 will continue to have an impact on our mental health. What are some ways that schools can support students and staff um, that are adapting to the next normal? Yeah, so uh, that's it, Flora. You just did it, right? Doing exactly what you just did. We want to acknowledge the problem uh, and ask the question, how can I help? Um, this is hard. Everything that's happening right now is really difficult and it's hard differently for everybody. So we want to talk with our students and we want to talk with each other about how it's going and have them co-construct what they need, right? So we want to do things with people, not to people. So we're going to support students in getting those needs met through classroom practices like morning meetings, like I talked about earlier, a mental health referral process that is uh, transparent and easy for people to understand and navigate, and strong community connections for meals and transportations and other types of needs that our students might need. And we also want to support students through fostering these regular connections with each other. I have a strong and well-communicated health benefit or EAP and demonstrating deep gratitude for the work that our staff is doing is also critically important for addressing this. Great. Thank you, Elizabeth. Now, how can building social emotional skills support the mental health of students and school staff and, and what are some strategies um, to help schools get started? Yeah, so I'm going to sound a little bit like a broken record, like you heard this before, but the research tells us that students with positive social emotional skills tend to have greater academic success and greater success after graduation. So I always like to root us uh, back to this idea that learning is emotional. And if we're in the business of learning as schools, then we need to really focus on the emotional aspects and the emotional growth of our students as well as our staff. So we know like things like a nuanced feelings vocabulary and high self-awareness and self-management of individual feelings is a protective factor against anxiety and depression and a whole host of other mental health concerns. So social emotional health is good all around, both on the mental health uh, side as well as on the academic side. Now, the approach for teaching the skills are actually two-pronged. Uh, the first is explicit instruction for students. There are a lot of great tools and resources out for that. Uh, Castle, for example, which is linked in this playbook, uh, has recently put out a really, really good deep dive on how to do this work. Um, and it can be as simple as doing an emotional check-in in your morning meeting or talking about task persistence before you start a hard math lesson, or it can be a total curriculum lift. So that's the first prong. The second problem is really around regularly modeling and reinforcing these skills across all school environments. So not just during your time of teaching, but literally at every moment, you as an adult want to be able to model uh, the skills yourselves and then reinforce it when you see the, your students doing them as well. So this means that us as adults, we need to tap into some vulnerability too. We know that kids do what kids see. So if we model it, they will do it. 
It's really important to apply the trauma-informed principles here, particularly equity and cultural humility. We wanted to develop our social emotional skills that are in line with the values and culture of our students, which may be different from our own. Great, thank you, Elizabeth. Um, and throughout the pandemic, uh, it's been it's become clear that schools are are, are truly the bedrock of support for students mm -hmm. and educators. Um, what role can schools play for individuals in need of additional mental health intervention or support? Yeah, I mean you're absolutely right, uh, Flora. Schools for uh, since the dawn of school time probably have been the epicenter and and the hub for supports and student uh, supports for students. And mental health intervention is, is no exception to that. Schools have always been in the business of providing social, emotional, behavioral interventions and supports for students. One of the best parts about our public education system is that we have a whole host of specialized instructional support personnel who can collaborate on a whole child approach to mental and behavioral health. The growing edge here is around efficiency and effectiveness, a strong referral pathway that indicates a process for identifying students, available interventions, exit and en entrance criteria, so we know how kids get in, but also how they're being successful and how we're scaffolding those supports off are incredibly important. A strong link to community providers and also a lot, a lot, a lot of family engagement. These are all critical to ensuring that students are getting what they need and the adults in the school environment are clear on what to expect, right? So you want both of those things, students getting their needs met and adults exactly knowing what the process is. So it's nice and transparent and clear. It's critical that staff co-construct these interventions with the students they're serving and collaborate with any external providers to ensure continuity of services so that if kids are moving in and out of different types of systems, the burden of switching is not on them, but really on the adults to align their languages and align their practices. Great. And I know, Elizabeth, you've highlighted a lot of great strategies and resources and, and tips for implementing these strategies. But as we wrap up there, um, do you have any uh, final thoughts to share? Yeah, I just really, I, I suppose, like a message, if I could say, for, for the folks watching, if that's all right with you, Flora. Yeah. Um, all right. So it's that, you know, research tells us the brain is wired to make meaning and to find certainty. And the more uncertain the circumstance, the more dysregulated we feel, which causes our thinking to narrow and we become more rigid uh, as we try to search for these perfect solutions. And so that to me is exactly where we're finding us now. But I wanna emphasize to the folks watching this is that the vibrancy and well-being of our school doesn't generate from perfect plans executed perfectly. It really comes from this collaborative sense of community and the knowledge that we're all in it together. And that's our strength, right? The strength of the public school system is around the collaboration uh, and all the various uh, uh, people and students and families uh, that really uh, pitch in in order to make it a vibrant space to live. Um, so my, kind of, I guess, final request is that we're kind to each other, right? And that we're kind to ourselves. And remember that we're all doing really great work and the best we can given the circumstances that we're in. Well, thank you, Elizabeth, um, for that message and for joining us today and really highlighting that uh, the, the, the strength of the school community is the school community itself and that we all have a, a role to play in, in, in making this experience work for all of us. Thanks, Lauren Elizabeth. Hopefully that gave you an idea of specific actionable plays we have included in each chapter. I wanted to spend a moment further sharing about our RISE or Resilience in School Environments initiative that Elizabeth mentioned in the conversation just now. We launched RISE on a national level just last year in 2019. Uh, it's a close partnership between Kaiser Permanente, the Alliance for a Healthier Generation and soon Discovery Education. It's proven to be a really valuable resource in our current time, given that it's virtual, it's free, and it's focused on social emotional health and supporting resilience. So it launched with a lot of great success last year, but it's even more important now than ever. So RISE offers virtual tools and resources to support schools' social and emotional health at no cost. The backbone of RISE is the RISE Index. It's an assessment tool that schools and districts create a free account and sign in. And there's a school level index and a district level index. And these are assessments that basically walk through the different policies, practices, systems at your school or district and figure out how they can be improved to support the social emotional health of school of your school or district. The RISE index or this assessment focuses on five key areas, school staff well-being, school systems, prevention strategies, intervention strategies, and collaboration amongst the various stakeholders at school. 
The RISE Index, as I mentioned, is available to everybody. We encourage everyone to get started here. Click on this link, create a free account, and uh, register as a school or district and see what's available. It lives on the Healthier Generation Action Center, and it is supported by a wealth of great resources. Uh, there's on-demand trainings, such as a Fill in Your Cup series, which supports staff well-being. And there's also a virtual program manager that you could reach out to for personalized support for your school or district. So on that note, we really value staff well-being, as I've said a few times. The next chapter I want to make sure we take a deep dive into is specifically staff and teacher well-being. I want to welcome back Flora Daniel from our Thriving Schools team, who's now interviewing Mary Mancuso, our national program lead, and a real school health employee expert from Kaiser Permanente. Welcome to a conversation on the staff and teacher well-being chapter of the Planning for Next Normal at School playbook. Today, I'm joined by Mary Mancuso, National Program Lead, Thriving Schools at Kaiser Permanente, and co-author of the staff and teacher well-being chapter. Welcome, Mary. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Yes, of course. Happy to have you with us. And to get our conversation started today, can you tell us about your background and expertise? Yeah, um, my my background is in public health with a focus on community health education. And um, prior to this role here with Thriving Schools, I also held roles at Kaiser Permanente focused on employee well-being, both internally with our own employees and externally with our Kaiser Permanente customer employer groups. I'm also a former public school teacher, and I had the privilege of co-authoring this chapter with Elizabeth Cook at Alliance for a Healthier Generation. Great, and thank you for sharing that. And Sounds like you've had some experience in well-being as well as uh, being an educator in the classroom. Can you share with us why it's important to consider um, teacher and staff well-being as we plan for the upcoming school year? Yeah, we, we tend to focus on children at the center of schools, which makes sense and is important. But we also have to remember that it's the adults in our schools that are needed for success. The airplane metaphor really applies here. You have to put your own oxygen mask on first in order to help others. So as, consider, as you're considering plans for the new school year, you can see how staff and teachers are impacted by all of the elements in this playbook, but we felt it was really important to not let them be a bullet point, for example, under your COVID prevention strategy or maybe under your social driver strategy. Staff and teachers need a dedicated consideration, so that's what we did for this playbook. If we want our return to learning this fall to be successful, we need to support staff and teachers so they're ready to educate and support leaders so they're ready to learn. Great, right. thank you, Mary. Thanks for grounding us in the importance of, of staff and teacher well-being. And before we dive a little bit deeper into the five plays, I just wanted to take a second to walk us through the five plays that we're covering today. So the first play is include staff in strategy development, prepare staff, foster resilience, empower personal well-being, and provide resources. Now, digging a little bit more into, into preparing and planning for the upcoming school year, how can schools and districts um, account for the unique identities and needs of all of their staff and teachers? Yeah, play number one. Um, it's so critical that we work with staff and teachers and local bar bargaining units on the different options that account for all situations. We know that higher risk staff and teachers may need special consideration for their health impacts. We know that variations on reopening, whether it be in person or distance or hybrid, will impact various roles differently. So we need to be mindful of all of these intricacies. Staff and teachers want to have the opportunity to be heard and have policies and procedures that reflect that voice. Uh, in the survey that we conducted, it was a recurring theme. Um, and in fact, one of the common write-in questions at the end was, Thank you for even asking us our opinion. Just the fact that we were asking, what are your needs and, and what are your thoughts on returning to learning? So you can do the same thing at your school or district. Set up a survey, coordinate office hours, and maybe a town hall to listen to your employees and hear what their concerns and suggestions are. And then follow up on what you're doing and how it was impacted and how it's different as a result of their feedback. No one likes to share feedback only to see nothing change. I also like this play because it really supports career well-being and that's the feeling that we have a say in how we do our jobs and it plays a really big role in our overall well-being. 
Thanks, Mary. So digging a little bit deeper into preparation as we return back to school, how can schools make sure that staff and teachers are prepared to successfully implement their district's return to learning plan? Yeah, with the onset of the pandemic, staff and teachers began taking on new roles, such as virtual educators, uh, community technology support, meal distributors, and likely even educating their own children at home. And many did this without additional resources or training. So a successful reopening is gonna include that professional learning with opportunities specific to job duties, as well as clear guidance around these new job, job duties and maybe how they've changed. This was another theme that was clear and consistent messaging in our, um, about clear and consistent messaging in our survey data. As the pandemic evolves, guidance continues to change and this uncertainty only adds to our anxiety and our stress, which impacts our overall well-being. So staff and teachers want clear guidance around what do these changes look like and how will they be implemented? For example, if students need to wear masks, who is gonna, who is gonna enforce that or how? Or if students can't share supplies, how can I get more? Or how will they be cleaned in between usage? So many of these unknown details and not knowing what to expect really heighten that anxiety. So it's so critical that we help staff feel confident that they know what the current messaging is and that they can share this with students and families. So leverage your existing communication channels, but know that you may have to also update or enhance uh, what you're using um, to account for these new times. So maybe your intranet site or regular email blasts, wherever staff and teachers know that they can always find the most up-to-date information. Thank you. And I know we've highlighted um, the need to support staff and, and teachers as well as you know, support their well-being. What are some ways um, that schools can prioritize and promote the resilience and collective well-being within the entire school community? Yeah, this play is all about fostering resilience at that systems level. So at Thriving Schools, we were already focused on this. We were already thinking about resilience in school environments through our RISE initiative, because we know that teachers and staff are overwhelmed, and we know that they are inhibited from creating meaningful and trusted relationships with students when they're stressed and overwhelmed. We also know that being resilient by managing emotions, recognizing strengths and weaknesses, and rising above that can increase academic performance in students as well as job satisfaction and performance in adults. So now more than ever, we need to we need our staff and teachers to have systems and structures in place to develop and foster collective well-being. Schools and districts can play a vital role in preparing and partnering with staff and community to reduce burnout and foster development of confident, happy kids who can excel in the classroom and in life. So one of these subplaces around collaboration, and I wanna highlight one of the resources that's here on this page. This is a great place to start collaborating by completing the RISE Index. This is a social and emotional well-being assessment tool for schools and districts. The RISE Index helps schools and districts assess, prioritize, and plan key actions that promote the social and emotional health of students, teachers, and staff. It's a great first step that leadership, staff, and teachers can collaborate on to complete, to jointly identify and evaluate their ability to meet best practices in resilience, social and emotional learning, and the mental wellness of staff and students. It's available at no cost to any school or district across the country. Great, thank you for highlighting that resource. Um, why is it important to encourage staff and teachers to prioritize their individual health and well-being and what are some strategies that schools can use to support staff and teachers as they prioritize their health and well-being? Yeah, it's likely that many of us can relate to that feeling like we aren't always managing very well. So it's important to remember that in these unprecedented times, we're learning how to adapt both personally and professionally while also trying to do our jobs. So understanding the cycle of burnout in order to recognize it and learning specific stress reduction strategies to help address it can help the emotional well-being of staff and teachers. And if we need to walk the walk, if we're gonna talk the talk. So it's not enough to just suggest well-being. We need to make sure we allow staff and teachers to schedule the time to take breaks to care for their well-being. Make sure it's clear around what is expected and how they can continue to care for themselves throughout the day. So I wanna highlight a really great resource on this page here that is from our Kaiser Permanente website about self-care. So if you click to this site, this is public and it's open to any 
Um, anyone in the public who wants to utilize these resources, um, we'll just take a look at this managing stress, that very first tile. And if you click on that, you'll find all kinds of guided exercises and activities. As I said, these are accessible to anyone. Um, you can see reframe your stress with a description, uh, maybe some mindfulness, many podcasts that will help you build a positive coping strategies for life's ups and downs. Well, that's awesome. That sounds like a, there are quite a few resources that are available there um, to support uh, staff and teachers. You know, are, 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 could you share with us some additional resources that schools can share with, with staff to support their well-being? Yeah, you likely have. Most of our audience here, you probably have many resources that are already available to you that you can leverage for staff and teacher well-being. Your district-sponsored health offerings probably have many COVID resources already. For example, the Kaiser Permanente self-care site that, I, that we just reviewed, um, which includes those no-cost resources. You can also leverage your employee assistance program. This is often an underutilized program that now is a great time to resurface that and make sure it's specifically promoted for this time of crisis. Uh, you can also highlight any well-being program resources if you already have those in place. Um, make these more visible, anything that supports the health and well-being during this time. You can also consider how your human resources policies may need to be revised. For example, providing paid time off during COVID-related absences, adjusting work schedules due to change in duties. Make sure you engage with your staff and teachers and local bargaining units early and often as you're making these revisions. So know that you don't have to do it alone. Outside of school and district, you can also find numerous resources to support your staff and teachers. Support communications that can connect to the existing community resources like financial planning or SNAP or Medicaid. Great. And, and as we wrap our conversation today, do you have any final thoughts you'd like to share? Just as I've said before, these are unprecedented times. They're hard. We're adapting. Kaiser Permanente is here to support you, but also for yourself, take a deep breath. You deserve some self-care as well. Awesome. That's a, that's a great message to leave us um, with, Mary. And thank you for joining us and sharing some tips and, and tools and resources and strategy to really support staff and teacher well-being. All right. Thanks again, Flora. And really good to hear uh, those specific plays, Mary. Appreciate it. So now that you've taken a deep dive into two of the chapters, I want to make sure you're aware of the other specific sections that you can access on your own um, in the playbook. Um, the next chapter is COVID-19 prevention, which was co-authored by our national partners at the Healthy Schools Campaign. You can see here on the slide the key five uh, takeaways or key five plays from the COVID-19 prevention chapter. I do want to mention that this doesn't go into a lot of specifics around um, amount of PPE or how often you should be washing your hands. We are well aware that schools and districts have a lot of uh, information and resources already, and they're each setting up their own specific COVID prevention systems. But uh, we, we thought this is, of course, an incredibly important section we could not include. So this is an overview chapter, and a lot of it points to quality resources available from the CDC and other resources you may already be accessing with your school and district. We have another section that is really important, especially in addressing the, the economic crisis that we're in together with the pandemic. It's around social drivers of health, and this was also co-authored by the Alliance for a Healthier Generation. Uh, this touches on really important broader community and, and national state and, and federal issues that we know are affecting a lot of our families that go to schools. Um, it starts by addressing and, and openly acknowledging institutional racism and how that has had a deep impact on the education system and our health outcomes. And then it goes into talking about specific resources on improving food security for the students and families that you support and oftentimes maybe some of your own staff. Um, it's working on local health and human services to help families enroll in Medicaid or health care coverage if they've lost it. Uh, resources for families experiencing housing instability or maybe homeless. And finally, connecting to a broader set of uh, financial resources and economic, uh, economic opportunities for families that may need it. But social drivers of health chapter is really important and may not seem obvious when you're thinking about schools, but we think you, you, um, you'll see the, the clear lines to how this supports school health as well. And then we also have a chapter on promoting physical education and physical activity during this time. Uh, this was co-authored by our national partners at Shape America. Um, physical education, physical activity experts. We were so happy to have them write this chapter with us. 
And this talks about a variety of resources, depending on if you're virtual, in person, hybrid, just trying to encourage as much movement and making sure that we don't lose the uh, physical activity needs of our students and staff as we're all doing so much sitting in so many virtual settings. So this this is a really important chapter that provides uh, tips for you know whatever whatever your school system is is looking like right now. I want to share that we've just done our actual first full round of edits and we're, we're launching our the 2.0 version of the playbook and we have a couple brand new additions and we added these additions because we got great feedback from our partners that there's some more needs. So we have a new section on funding and other considerations and this is how to fund a lot of the recommendations we have in the playbook that was co-authored by Future Ed from Georgetown. Really excited to have that section added. And then, as I mentioned earlier, we just created a family checklist, and this is to help schools and districts support parents, caregivers, families that are, you know, way more involved in education than they used to be. So there's a specific checklist that's a brand new section, and Healthy Schools Campaign helped us co-write that section. So I've mentioned the checklist a couple times. I wanted to call out that we have another section in the playbook website the, uh, where I'll provide your link, the link to in a minute. These are printable and inter interactive checklists for each separate chapter. So if you're interested in just addressing a few dimensions of health, you can interact with or print just a couple of those checklists and figure out what exactly your school needs to needs to do to, you know, to improve that specific dimension of health, or you can print all the checklists and, you know, this will help you and your, your colleagues working on this track, your progress as, as you improve your whole school health during this. So the checklists are meant to be, um, are meant to be useful and really quick, easy go-to places versus having to go back into the entire chapter. Uh, these, these, these are one way we're trying to make it really available and actionable. We also have additional videos with chapter experts that you can find on the website, and I encourage you to go and, and look at any or all of those depending on the topics that are of interest to you. So I wanted to end with a few specific items on how you can take action in case you aren't already doing so. Um, you can see here the link for uh, how to access the playbook website where you can access the full playbook, all of the content and resources, the checklists I just mentioned, the videos, and there's actually pre-recorded webinars that we, we when, when we launch the playbook that are available there too. So a wealth of resources available for you. We encourage you to take the playbook specifically, review your school or district plans for this current and even possibly this coming school year if you're starting to plan for next school year, determine where and when these specific plays can be incorporated to your school where you may be weak in areas and then pull plays out that, that work for your specific area. Um, we want you to make sure you reach out to the specialized instructional support personnel that are available, school nurses, school counselors, school psychologists, and they'll really help support activation of some of these specific starter plays. So please include those experts when you're moving forward. Um, many of you are already doing so, but continue to find allies inside and outside of your school or your district to advocate for and support implementing playbook strategies. These can be community-based organizations, other nonprofits, um, health providers, whoever is available in your region that may be able to help activate those plays. And finally, I wanted to remind you of all the wealth of RISE resources that we have that are specifically focusing on resilience and social emotional well-being of everybody in this, this really important time. Visit the Healthier Generation Action Center to create a free account and access all the RISE index and the resources. You'll find that link here as well. So those are all of the currently available things that we think might be helpful to you in whatever role you play. Um, thank you so much for your time, and I look forward to moving over to some Q&A right now. All right, thank you. So um, we'll take a couple minutes to see if any, uh, if give folks some time to um, type in some questions and answers and I will take a look and see what we have so far. There are a couple comments appreciating the resources. So thank you very much um, to Kaiser Permanente and the rest of the, 
the organizations that contributed to putting all of those together. And again, a reminder, just quickly type in a question if you have one. Um, While people are doing that, I guess I can jump in. Um, we have gotten some questions around, uh, as I mentioned just now, we've just yesterday, what day is it, Wednesday? Monday, <laughs> two days ago, I know we're all a little loose on time these days, uh, launched the second version of the playbook, as I mentioned. So it is kind of you know 2.0, second edition. We're very excited about it. We added those funding resources that we mentioned, um, a stronger focus on the kind of family support. Um, and we've gotten questions, you know, how many iterations are you going to do? When is this going to kind of be what it is? And I think the second edition we just did will probably um, live until the end of the calendar year, at least take us through the holidays and just knowing all the uncertainty that's happening um, with the school world, we're probably not gonna do a third version uh, until maybe you know the kind of later winter, early spring, seeing where schools are and kind of what changes happen. But we're trying to, you know, Put out new edits as soon as possible, but not um, over edit. Just knowing schools are in such different places right now, and it's hard to know in two months, you know, what the what the education landscape will be. Great. We got a question in. We got two questions in that are sort of related. If you have examples of schools that are successfully implementing the playbook, um, specifically from California, who in California has been implementing, or that you've been in conversation with around implementing parts of this playbook? Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, we have had uh, the Fairfield Sassoon School District, which is here in the Northern California. I say here. I, I'm in Oakland. I don't know if I mentioned that. Um, they're just north of the Bay Area. They have grabbed onto the playbook and implemented a couple of sections, uh, especially the um, mental health and wellness, actually in the school well-being chapters, the ones we just took a deep dive into. So um, they created this amazing uh, virtual well-being platform and page where students and, and staff can go and grab different resources and it's kind of specific to their district. And then they have also been looking at some of the policies they have in their school district around supporting staff in this unprecedented virtual time, making sure they have space for their own well-being. So Fairfield Sassoon was a very early adopter. Um, and uh, I believe we know that uh, Santa, Santa Cruz grabbed onto it. It was interesting because a lot of this was happening or launching and then all of the fires in California has been going on. So as we know, we have um, you know pandemic on top of disaster, on top of economic crisis. And um, so the areas that were uh, affected by the fires. Also, we're looking at some of the you know, general stress reduction, uh, well-being sections, and, and we heard that interestingly, those played out well for a natural disaster in addition to um, you know, uh, the, the, the pandemic, because these are basically recommendations that work for any sort of virtual setting. Those are the examples just now. I also believe San Diego Unified down in Southern California has been using the playbook, and we heard good things. They, they did quite a bit with the physical education, physical activity section. Um, and that's why we had different sections because every district instead of schools needs a different, you know, a, a different thing to focus on. Um, we didn't go, take a deep dive into that chapter, but we know that's a really important additional health concern is we're all sitting so much and our kids are sitting so much and how do we try to keep people active. So um, San Diego used some of that. And I will mention these are districts that had already been involved in some of these activities. And so it was pretty easy for them to grab on and, and you know, make use of the additional activities, but this is open and freely available to everybody. And maybe on the side note, I focus on the playbook, the RISE resources that came up multiple times just now um, have been used by now over 2000 schools nationwide. Um, about, I believe three to 400 of those are in the California area, you know, both our Northern and Southern California regions. We split them up because we're such a large state. Um, and we have had a whole host of, of you know, work in RISE because it started earlier. RISE was in place last fall. And so it's been on the ground about a year. And of course it shifted um, when school shifted, but surprisingly it was it was pretty well set up to support schools. So RISE has been used by hundreds of schools in California, a couple thousand nationwide. And again, what we hear over and over is the staff support pieces are really valuable. Um, RISE is, is broader and it of course talks about student sections and, and, and we've had school leaders use those, but it's the staff pieces that I think people just feel like they want more and more and there aren't as many of those in other places. 
Um, so, so that's been um, that's been helpful. We've also heard that Rise part has partnered, and, and we are working on making sure it fits in well to other efforts such as PBIS or Positive Behavior Intervention Supports, which you know, most of you probably know about, and many of your schools use. It fits in well with Castle and the social emotional learning curriculum that, 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 that Castle has in many schools. So Rise is a really nice, I would say, add-on or complement because it has a strong staff support and it has space and it asks for, are you doing these types of things? Great, that fits in. We're not we're not trying to compete, but rather complement and create you know a bigger set of support um, that that you know adds on to SEL and PBS type. Um, I don't see any other questions coming in at this time, so um, I think you could take a moment to wrap up and we will close the session. Great. Well, just thanks again, Lisa and everyone at the California School Based Health Alliance. We are so happy to have this you know, moment to, to bring you the resources we have. Please continue to go to, to the links that, that have been shared. We are updating the playbook. We always have new resources coming at RISE. Um, a little sneak peek, we actually have some discovery education modules coming. These are with the, the Discovery Education Network that creates a discovery channel. Um, these are trauma-informed modules aimed at educators um, to take care of themselves. Those are going to be freely available to all starting in just a couple weeks. So you know, keep checking um, the RISE link and the uh, uh, playbook link because we have a lot more coming. And thank you for your time and attention and giving us a little bit of your, your, you know, your focus and what is a really surely busy time. Thanks, everyone.